Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ninth of the Military Aviation Museum's webinars. We're so happy to have you all here this evening. I'm Keegan Chetwin, Director of the Military Aviation Museum. And uh, tonight we're going to be exploring the evolution of the aircraft carrier, and our guest tonight is Boom Powell. So, without further ado, uh, our speaker tonight is Boom Powell. He's a docent here at the museum, as well as one of our Military Aviation Museum pilots, and an esteemed author, though lately I'm told uh, his profession is gardening. Uh, you know, being that he's on lockdown, anytime a plant needs to be dug up or a hole needs to be dug for a new one, Boom has been filling that role at home. Um, he's the son of a B-24 navigator who flew during World War II. Uh, Boom has a Vietnam tour under his belt uh, as an A-4 Skyhawk pilot. He was later an instructor in the type. And uh, he transitioned to the Vigilante, another carrier-borne aircraft, a reconnaissance type. And uh, ultimately was drafted to be the LSO uh, for training squadron for the Vigilante for three years. And uh, he's deployed on the Forrestal and the Kitty Hawk. And uh, he also had a tour as a naval attache in South Africa, really a kind of an interesting and storied career. Um, with that said, Boom, I'll turn it over to you to kind of tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, take us through this incredible evolutionary journey that is the modern aircraft carrier. Great. Thank you, Keegan. Uh, I think I'd like to start out actually by talking a little bit about this presentation. Um, the Landing Signal Officer School, the LSO School, is actually close by in Oceana, Naval Air Station Oceana. And oh, let's see, it was six, seven years ago, a couple of the volunteers at the museum, ex-Navy aviators, um, said, let's bring the LSOs down and let them look at our museum. And I said, great idea. And the next thing you know, we were doing a little PowerPoint presentation for them about the history of landing aboard the ship. And it kind of grew to a point where now it's part of the syllabus for the LSO school when a class comes down and through. Well, in the meantime, there is a little bit of a spin-off. Um, how about doing it somewhere else and doing it for other people? And I said, okay, uh, I kind of modified it a little bit uh, so everybody would have a better understanding of it. But about a year ago, I had a little bit of a challenge given to me. The Hampton Yacht Club invited me to speak. And I go, Yacht Club? Okay, what am I going to talk to a yacht club about? And this is what I came up with. And they're not kidding. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, they all kind of got a giggle out of it, which I thought was funny. Uh, you're looking at the Truman out there like that. And I won't even read the numbers up, but they're immense, but it's over a thousand foot long. I mean, monstrous ships. So I consider them kind of the yachts we went through in the thing. This is a view that's familiar to any of the current Navy pilots going through. This is coming aboard one of our standard uh, air nuclear powered aircraft carriers now. Exactly which one of these, I don't know, but it doesn't make any difference because they're all similar. Um, you can see the landing aid off to the side, uh, the green bar with the famous meatball in the middle, and the landing signal officers and their white, they call them float coats, they're, they're life preservers. Um, in case of emergencies off to the left side as well, and then the landing area. But what we're gonna do first here, we're gonna go back in time. We're gonna work backwards. Um, this is the big one, this is the big CVNs. In my era, when I was flying, we flew off of big decks as well, but they were conventionally powered. So I was curious how the two of them compared. And you're looking here at the conventionally powered Kitty Hawk, uh, lately uh, put out to pasture, actually it was scrapped and doing that in the Carl Vinson, typical of the new CVNs when they're doing it. You'll see they are basically almost identical. There's no big changes. The only real change is in the power plant. Um, one of them generates smoke and gas and the other one doesn't. It relies on all those magic electrons uh, when you have that. It's a little jargon for you. Uh, why do we call them CVs? Uh, C was for carrier, and I didn't know until fairly recently the reason we call them V is it's from the French word for flying. Uh, Navy, Air, Navy squadrons are designated by V and carriers become CV. So you have that. This is the, probably the big change um, that happened. On the left is what we call the 27 Charlie carrier. It's an easy way of saying it's, it's an S's class that's converted. Uh, they went through a whole series of everything, 27 Alpha, 27 Charlies, 120, 125s. Uh, won't bother you with the nomenclature, but it's just simpler to say it's a 27 Charlie. 
uh, rather than summing up the fact that it's got modern arresting gear, space for jet fuel, and of course the angle to deck becomes one of the biggest items involved. The thing I like to point out with this slide more than a lot of other things is not so much the difference in length, it's the difference in area that really counts here. Um, there's a great deal more room on the flight deck, as you can see when we're looking at it. The big point to make, though, is kind of an interesting one. The landing area on both of them is exactly the same size. It's kind of the same arresting gear. That area is still the same. Of course, the bigger deck now has additional catapults. Uh, when you've got it on, it can carry a lot more aircraft and a lot larger aircraft. During the Vietnam War, one half of the carriers that deployed to the Tonkin Gulf of the Vietnam War were 27 Charlies, um, the slightly smaller decks. Uh, so there's many of us that when we got a chance to land on the Forrestal or later class ships, including the Kitty Hawk, we thought of them as the big deck. And that was the comparison we had here. And uh, there we go. This is the view coming aboard a 27 Charlie. Remember that number one, the first thing you notice is there's no aircraft parked over the left side of the landing area. There just wasn't room for them. Um, when you have that situation like that, you're going through the thing. The lens area, the landing aid is the same. You can see the LSOs over there dressed a little differently. Uh, white, and one of them's got his orange suit on. This guy's a little bit left of center line, and that's the view we saw. It becomes a point for those that are involved in carrier aviation, the powering of the ship, you look at the island structure, and that haze you see isn't on the picture. It's what we call stack gas. And at times, it could get bad and come out behind it. 27 Charlie, our babies here. Here's the big difference that came out. Uh, late 50s, uh, when this finally happened, uh, comparison, Essex, the first of her class on the left, and then the Oriskany on the other side, one of the 27 Charlies. The ship's length is the same because it's the same hull. They are basically the same air, uh, same ships underneath. The engineering plants are identical and everything else. The difference being, of course, the layout for the thing. Instead of just four arresting wires that the uh, 27 Charlies have, the Essex class had anywhere between 13 and 20, depending on the individual airplanes. The secret to operating successfully in the Essex class that made them so successful is that there was a barrier put up, up about near the island structure at the end of all the wires. It stuck about two feet up above the deck, and the intention was that it would engage the wheels of an airplane that did not engage a wire and keep it from going up all the way forward. This gave us the capability of running what we called cyclic operations. You could park all the air, your land airplanes, park them all up on the bow, land airplanes, everybody was on board, and then when you were running downwind and getting ready for the next one, you'd push all the airplanes back into what had been the landing area, and you could deck launch them as they went through. You didn't necessarily have to use the catapults, and that was the secret. Barriers weren't perfect. They worked out, as I said, the intention was there, and it was far better than running into a pack. But as you could see, sometimes if you hit it a little bit too fast and the prop caught it, it would go up and over or a little bit of whoopsie action on the thing when it hit the barrier. But again, better than going all the way forward. The lower picture is once jet aircraft came with their nose wheels, they realized that sometimes the nose wheel would kind of knock the barrier down, lay it down. So it didn't always guarantee bringing the airplane to a stop. And they came up with the barricade. Uh, that much higher thing with uh, steel cables inside of nylon straps, uh, which is raised and lowered hydraulically uh, to keep the jets out of the, the forward part of the pack. What did it look like coming aboard a straight deck? This is the view from the back seat of something, either an Avenger or a Hell Diver, coming up the land. You can see the landing signal officer behind his windscreen there with his arms out giving signals. But then look forward. Tremendous psychological uh, disadvantage of landing an aircraft like this. That whole pack was parked up in front of you. There was this mandatory signal called a cut, which means you're cleared to land, chop the power, and come on down. Once you had taken the cut, one of two things was going to happen. You were either going to get a successful arrested landing, or you were going to crash. 
heck of an option, but that's the way it was in the old days. Here's another view of landing on the straight deck carrier. This is Korean War vintage, uh, Jet Banshee coming in. It's a difficult picture. I'm sorry, the quality is not better, but you can see the barriers in front and then farther down the barricade. And again, the pack, as they called it, is parked up front, the aircraft getting ready to go. So that's the SS class, which basically we survived World War II with and did very well. This is a different version. This is a CVL, L in this case for light. It's a light aircraft carrier, very sleek looking. They were built on cruiser hulls and consequently were very fast. Um, it was easy for them to stay up with the main battle group and with the big carriers. They were talking now in the high 20s, maybe even 30 knots of speed that was capable of them. A Little bit smaller, um, as you'll see in the diagram, we talk about it. But it's the same principle the CVLs did as the big things do. They had barriers up farther forward. And my question when I show this picture to the LSO class, I say, do you know what's going on here? The answer is they're running carrier qualifications. And the reason I know that is there's only one airplane on the deck. The fact it's an SNJ, of course, is another hint giving it away that it's something in the training command. The options you had with the system they had here is to land, you know, six, seven, eight airplanes, rig the barriers up and have the airplanes parked in the bow, shut everybody down, reposition them, put them all the way back. A little awkward and time consuming. So what they did for carrier training is they'd land them, they'd land in the wires, they'd pull them back a little ways, they'd raise his hook, they'd run the power up, and they'd deck launch for another landing at the thing. They could work about six aircraft at a time in the pattern. And that was the CVLs up in very nice fast ships. This is the size comparison. You can see it obviously couldn't carry as many aircraft on board, but they could stay up there. It's an interesting expedient all the way through, so they had the CVLs. But we're not done yet. How does that look like for fun? This is a CBE, the escort carriers, um, built on merchant hulls. So their sea keeping qualities were not the best. And they tended to work things like the Merman's Run and go up to the North Atlantic. Um, they're a little bit difficult. They were built wartime production. They kind of came off the shipyard in a big hurry all the way through. The United States built 122 of these. CVEs during World War II. We gave almost half of them to the English. Their first use was in the North Atlantic, escorting convoys to keep the submarines down. Once there was a sufficient number of them, they diverted them off to hunt submarines on their own, their own individual hunter killer groups. They'd load airplanes on board with depth charges and some search aircraft and go out and actually hunt submarines. And then, of course, as time went on, they started using them in the Pacific as well. They were slow, but that was all right. They could go and murrow off some island that was being invaded and provide close air support very easily and very mobile, plus ferrying airplanes around. Some of them were, five of them were sunk eventually. Um, one of them just kind of exploded. And the sailors used to joke that CBE stood for combustible, vulnerable, expendable. But they were amazing ships. They came out of the Kaiser Yard. You'll hear them called Jeep carriers as well, or Kaiser carriers. There's a story from the Puget shipyards that came out there. The Navy contracted the shipyard to build 18 CBEs in one month. The war workers in the spirit of the time said, you know something, we can do better than that. And they produced a 19th. They built 19 of these in one month. It became known as the bonus carrier in doing that. How's my CVE look in comparison? There she is. Again, much smaller, not a whole lot of room to park aircraft up forward, but very useful, a very useful ship in one of those things. And of course, So when I talk to the LSO class, one of the things I tell them is go out here forward, just forward of the island, and look back towards the stern, and that is the size of the ships that your predecessors flew and waved airplanes onto. Our first carrier was about 50 feet longer than a CVE, so still not very large. 
first landing 1922, 98 years ago. So we're coming up on the centennial of actual carrier aviation. Why do we put airplanes at sea? I think the airplanes are pretty obvious for that thing. It was started as a lookout, was the whole basic principle they did that. First seaplane, a Frenchman got to build it. Glenn Curtis followed along, but later in the same year. I love this hydroavion, because you look at the external spars uh, built with their lattice work holding the airplane up. So seaplanes did exist. They said, let's try some other stuff. So the Navy got together with Glenn Curtis and says, what a wonderful idea. Let's try what we can do here. And they got down the cruiser to Birmingham and they built a sloping takeoff deck in the forward part of the ship. And Eugene Ely got into a Curtis pusher and right here in Hampton Roads made the first ever takeoff from a ship in his Curtis pusher. The original plan was to have the ship underway, but the weather was terrible, so they didn't. He took off. Um, actually had trouble kind of recovering, splashed to the water, damaged his propeller, and headed for the nearest land, which is good old Willoughby Spit out here, and did that, thinking he was a failure, but everybody hailed him as a hero. They said, okay, we can take them off from a ship. Now, how about we can do the other end? The Navy again cooperated and provided to Pennsylvania another cruiser. This time it's in San Francisco. And they built a temporary landing aircraft deck on the thing on the back end. Uh, all the structure was still aboard, but they did put the landing deck on the thing. And then sure enough, in 1911, in January, again, Eugene Ely at the controls of a Curtis pusher landed aboard the Pennsylvania. That was the first ever landing of an aircraft aboard a ship. The pictures you're looking at here, you can see one of the landing, another view of the landing, and finally his takeoff when it came up and did it from there. Interesting feat. This is the usual picture you see in the history books when they're talking about the first carrier, carrier landing. It wasn't even a carrier. The first shipboard landing, the deck was 119 feet. I called them CDPs. That's the modern term, cross deck pennant. There were nothing more than rope strung across, weighted to sandbags. The Navy being clever, instead of fancy sandbags, went down and took sailors' duffel bags and filled them with sand and the ropes across. The boards, the vertical boards along the sides there are simply to hold the rope up. That's all they did. On the bottom of the aircraft, it didn't have a fuselage, on the bottom of the keel, as they called it, had some fishermen's grappling hooks set to help bring the airplane to a stop. This picture is much more illustrative of what went on on that first shipboard landing. Here's Ely being led away from the airplane you can see back by counting, he actually engaged five of the ropes, pulling five of the bags to bring him to a stop before hitting those canvas barriers in the very front of things. Interesting point is you will notice that he's off to the left side of the ship. If it hadn't been for those boards intended to hold the ropes up, he would have probably skidded even farther off. It became a problem all the way through when they were doing it. Here's our boy, again, a terrible blow up of a picture. He was wearing a business suit with a stiff collar, a nice leather coat. He put on an old football helmet to help protect his head just in case something went wrong. And a little known fact is Eugene Ely could not swim. So he was risking a lot flying on and off ships. He rigged up, those are bicycle tubes wrapped around his chest and shoulders in case he went into the water to help him float. The centennial was coming up, and three years before that, a gentleman named Bob Coolbaugh, ex-Navy pilot and an LSO, said, you know something, for this 100-year centennial, I think I'm going to build a full-size flying replica of the Ely Curtis pusher, which he did, and he had it. Of course, the Navy thought this was wonderful for the celebrations involving the centennial, and they said, okay, let's load it on board one of the ships and we'll do a big photo op up there. Well, he said, how about I fly aboard? The Navy said, no, you can't do that. He said, well, how about if I take off at least? No, you can't do that either. So the airplane was simply hoisted on board the H.W. Bush, uh, ran around the flight deck a little bit. And as you can see, it took some pictures of the thing and doing that. But that was kind of the celebration of the airplane. That particular replica wound up being sold here to the Military Aviation Museum. 
Interesting airplane. I could talk for a long time, both on the flying qualities of that particular airplane, the background of our particular replica, and a little more of the history of Ely. But that'll be another entire talk by itself. So we'll just leave it for now. It's a very interesting airplane to fly. The picture, by the way, is me making my first ever landing in the Curtis Pusher, and close-ups of my expression are not permitted. World War I came. Aviation ships. They did call them carriers occasionally, but to keep it simple, I call them aviation ships. You'll see the thing most of them have in columns, they had flying off platforms. That's what they worked with. The idea was if it was a wheeled airplane, it would take off and either fly someplace ashore or ditch alongside with all the risks that involved and the loss of the airplane. And it was a float airplane, either hulled or with pontoons. They put them on cradles of various types and launched them. They'd land alongside and get hoisted on board the ships. Well, the English looked at it and said, hmm, let's try something different. HMS Furious was built as a, as a cruiser and had it all set. She had rather unique armament. She had two 18-inch guns on her. They were the largest guns, by the way, naval guns until the Japanese battleships of World War II. Two 18-inch guns, one gun per turret, one turret forward, one turret aft. There was a delay in the manufacture of one of the turrets and guns, so they said, okay, let's make a flying off platform in this cruiser, because this will be fast, they can stay up with the battle group. And they had a hangar deck and a flying off platform and ready to go. And that was in the first attempts, and in a sense, it's the first true aircraft carrier. They flew SOP with pups off the flying off platform, Squadron leader Dunning was the senior officer flying the pups. And he, after several takeoffs and working with the ship a little bit, said, you know something? The pups speed is such that with the ship going full speed and some wind over the deck, I have about five miles an hour to play with. And what he did is he flew alongside the ship and then gently side slipped it over the deck where his fellow officers reached up and acted as his arresting gear to pull him down to a successful landing. That was the first ever landing of a ship moving at sea. Remember, Ely's both were done in ships were at anchors. So that was the first ship landing at sea with the ship moving. He tried it a couple days later, got one successful landing. Uh, we're not sure if this picture is of a successful one or his attempt to go around on a second one. Anyway, the wind caught him and basically blew him over the side. Unfortunately, he was trapped in the wreckage and drowned. But that was the true beginning of carrier aviation. The Royal Navy said, let's continue with this idea. So they took the Furious and built a flying on deck, they called it, back in the after part of the ship. The ship's superstructure still stuck up in the middle of everything else. So the idea was they'd land the airplanes, taxi them on those taxiways alongside, drag them up, drag them forward, and fly off the flying off deck. They did run some tests with SOP with pups. They even tried putting skids on it. You'll notice there's a lot of fore and aft wires as well. This is to make sure the airplane stayed lined up and not drift over the side. They were more afraid of that. They ran some tests one day, and of the 13 aircraft they had out there, three of them were flyable by the end of the day. So it was not a good thing. The problem, which they didn't realize and start to develop as time went on, the modern term, we call it verbal, and it's all the turbulent air that's generated by the superstructure of the ship coming back over the landing on area, a real problem, hence the solutions they came up with. Development continued. They tried a couple things on this one like that. <clears throat> uh, the first one they came up with was on the uh, I'm sorry, the Argus was the first, the flush deck. They went completely flush to try it. Uh, the Argus was kind of interesting. Uh, she was actually starting to be built as an Italian ocean liner, a luxury ship that did that. So in 1918, they had her and going for the thing. A couple of years later, they tried the Eagle. Uh, you can see there, that was one of the first island structures. It looks almost completely modern with a large island and the other problems like that. Eagle was a rather interesting ship as well. It was started as being a Chilean battleship being built in England for Chile, and they didn't do it. The Royal Navy guys are still talking about the ship, I think, to this day, 
because all the engine room instructions were in Spanish and all the measurements were metric. Question, which of these was the first specially built aircraft carrier? Started all the way from the hull up. The design was, the only intention was to make an aircraft carrier out of it. And the answer is, take your pick. It can be argued for either one of those, depending on which way you're particularly prone. The Hermes, the Royal Navy ship, was actually laid down and started first, but the Japanese Hosho last, uh, was in commission first and had landings before the Hermes did. Other question that's always interesting, after we sank all those Japanese aircraft carriers during World War II, the Zuikaku, Shokaku, Kaga, Kaga, whatever, uh, going through the thing, what was the only survivor? And the answer was the Hosho, their very first one. She participated in Midway in the second area of the battle farther back, but she did survive the war afterwards as a training carrier and brought troops back when they had the thing going from there. So the U.S. decided to get in the act. It's almost an obsolete term now. This is a collier you're looking at. A collier is somebody or something that carries coal, uh, be it a train or an individual, they have that. And Navy ships, when they were powered by coal during the first war, needed to be supplied with coal, and they built a collier for it, the Jupiter, uh, during First World War. Well, the Navy was getting out of the coal business, and they were getting into fuel oils for powering their ships, so there was no need for a collier. And they said, well, maybe we can do something with it. It was actually a very modern ship. It was electrically powered. It burned, uh, it burned a lot of coal originally, and then fuel oil to drive generators, which drove electric motors. Um, so it was an electrically powered ship and they had it, but what are they gonna do with it? It's a collier now. So they said, let's shave all this miscellaneous stuff off the top and we'll install a flight deck on the top. Her nickname was the covered wagon. You can kind of see why. The collier was a good choice. There was space underneath for fuel and airplane storage. She had elevators uh, and worked it up very well. One of the things to keep in mind another thing when we started doing it, um, first landings and stuff, their ship was originally designed for 12 aircraft, but Captain Reeve, uh, who was in charge of it, um, kept pushing and pushing. He pushed the aviators all the way through and worked it harder. And by the end of her career, the Langley was flying 41 airplanes on a ship that was originally designed only for a fairly smaller number. Here's another picture of the Langley. You can see she started out again with the fore and aft wire. She had the transverse wires as well, with the normal ones we consider now as a resting gear, but she did have the little fore and aft wires in the original installation. Of course, when she flew, it was rather an interesting evolution. Obviously, the radar mass came down and the flagpole came down. The stacks lowered, the screening along the side was lowered as well, and they flew the airplanes into the thing. Does anybody know what this interesting structure in the fantail is? It's a pigeon coop for carrier pigeons, pun intended. In the old days, Navy ships and even larger aircraft would carry carrier pigeons, days before radio or radio was very weak. And they'd stick a message into this little parcel on the ship's and the pigeon's leg and launch them off to fly someplace and deliver messages that way. Well, there was radio in effect by this time. So what do you do with an old bird coop? They made it the executive officer's cabin. Anyway, Ken Whiting was the executive officer and this became his space. First landing, uh, first American landing on a, a ship at sea. Uh, Godfrey Chevalier did it in this old era of Marine 39. You can see the weird rig that existed for the arresting gears. The number of fiddle bridges that required to hold up both the transverse and the long longitudinal resting gear. It's hard to make out in this photograph, but he didn't really have a tail hook. It was kind of a body hook. Uh, it was fastened to the sides of the fuselage and there was kind of this giant A-frame that hung down. You can see it in the back. Also between the main landing gear, you can see a bunch of T-hooks. And those are designed to engage the fore and aft wires and keep them going and do that. You've heard the expression, of course, that a good landing is one you can walk away from, and a great landing is one where the airplane can use it again. Well, this was a good landing. He went over in his nose afterwards. 
So they had the airplanes pretty well worked out by then, and they had their resting gear system worked out pretty well, this type of thing. One of the things that I think a lot of people assume is that how simple is a tail hook? Just drop it down there. Well, it's actually a fairly complex mechanism when you think about it. Uh, number one, it's got to be structurally strong so that it will definitely hang on and do the thing. It does need to be retractable to get it up out of the way and lowerable, so you can control that. It does need a certain amount of lateral movement, so it can be affected by that, but at the same time, it can't be too much lateral movement. So that's all the wires and cables you can see in that particular hook. The scoop thing, by the way, in front of the wheels was in case of ditching at sea. The idea was to keep the airplane from nosing over. So we figured out to get the airplanes on board. What did we need at this point? We needed some way for some form of guidance for the airplanes that were landing. This supposedly is a picture of the first LSOs at work. And the apocryphal story is it was command, the Lieutenant Commander Whiting himself, the executive officer of the ship. When they would do landings, he'd go out to the aft end of the ship and watch the landings. And he'd be using body English. He'd be kind of waving it out and waving his arms. And one day, one of the pilots says, I saw you out there waving at me. And he says, you did? And he said, yeah. And he says, Start, I started stationing a qualified pilot back there to give signals to help the pilots bring the airplanes aboard correctly. The first ones were nothing more than you're high or you're low or you're on glide slope. Uh, the original use was semaphore flags. Um, for some reason, in this picture, the semaphore flags were whited out. Also whited out were the two straps that to the belt wrapped around his waist to hold him in place on this platform at the very aft end of the ship and doing that. Um, they realized quickly enough that uh, flags would wave in the breeze and they'd look very thin and were hard to see, so they came up with paddles instead. There we go. Early LSO. Um, paddles at that point either became ribbons of some type so the wind could blow through them or some form of net, uh, which this gentleman has here. You can see the platform is moving back a little bit, but it's a little tiny nothing. The wind barrier is up, provided behind him. Single phone talker, I'm not even sure who he's talking to in these days, but a hardly a sophisticated rig at all. He was just back there to help guide the airplanes on board the ship that developed as time went on. How many LSOs can you name by individual names? This is probably the one that many people can. And the interesting thing is Beer Barrel was fictional. But you do have it. The movie, The Bridges of Toko Re, Robert Strauss was the actor, but Hollywood got it right, as you can see in this picture. Um, the signals are good, the paddles are good. Uh, the LSOs wore bright fluorescent strips so the pilots could see their body a little more interesting and they have him standing behind his wind barrier. Other thing I'll bring up at this point is notice the other LSO, his writer, assistant, or trainee, has to stand directly behind him. Because if you're giving signals with your arms, having somebody else there with another arm visible tends to be confusing. So that's a situation that lasted at the beginning. Lots of LSOs were pretty well standardized by then. Lots of fluorescent stripes, lots of open paddles and we were truly into the business all the way into World War II. A selection of paddles, I obviously can't do it in the format we're working in today. When I work with a live audience, I have a set of these, and I have some volunteer come up and stand in front and hold their arms out straight holding the paddles, and hold it out there for about 30 seconds. Give them a break for another 30 seconds and have them put their arms back up there. Not the easiest thing in the world, especially when you had 25 to 30 knots of wind blowing on your back and they're doing that. The British didn't call them paddles, they called them bats. Picture them in the lower corner, and consequently, they did not have LSOs or paddles as we call them. They had batsmen in doing that, but they're as much development as that we were. Navy signals all the way through. The common image is a guy doing this dance and doing all these kinds of crazy signals and going through all this thing and forget it. It didn't work that way. There was so little time when the aircraft was actually in the groove it was basically time for only three or four big signals. The higher ones, the farther out, the things you forgot um, had to be given way out there before you did it. Basically, once they got in close, it was the directions and the highs or lows. At the bottom are the mandatories. The famous cut, chop your power and go ahead and land, and the wave off. There was no question about those. Those are orders and they had to absolutely be followed. 
what the pattern look like. This is the standard pattern back then, all the way through Korea, all the way into the early 1950s. They flew a low flat pass. The flight of airplanes would come up on the starboard side of the ship at a couple hundred feet. They'd turn down wind, taking their interval about 200 feet. And then he'd start this turn, uh, slowing down. They're only about five to, you know, maybe five to 10 knots above their stalling speed. And as they're coming through this turn, they're less than 100 feet as they're turning through. Most airplanes of the kind, think of our Avenger, our Corsair, even things like the Wildcat, the view over your nose was not very good. So the turn had to last for a while. You kept turning and looking at LSO signals. He'd finally straighten you out, and what usually happened, he'd turn you, get you exactly where he'd want you in the groove, leveled your wings, and gave you the cut. And he'd say, chop, we're ready to go from there. And you'd look at the landing area, and you'd make your landing approach. This was the standard thing all the way through for a long time. LSOs are colorful guys, got a lot of body English to it. Um, this guy's giving a cut signal. Why he's leaning this way, I don't know. But you notice all three guys in the platform are standing right behind each other and they're doing it ready to go for there. Ah, I said they're a crazy bunch and interesting guys. When they're doing field carrier landing practice or shore, it's not unusual to guys to strip down to bathing suits or shorts and soak up a couple of rays. But this picture is taken at sea. This is actually aboard the USS Yorktown, the Hellcat coming aboard. And there he is wearing his nice Hawaiian flowered bathing suit and giving LSO signals. And you go, okay, that's interesting. Colorful LSO, his name was Dick Tripp. So I said, surely I can find a picture of this gentleman dressed as an LSO supposed to be. Yeah, I did, there he is. Wearing basically flight coveralls. He's got a skull cap on now, his waving cap and sunglasses and there's his stuff. Anybody notice he hasn't got any shoes on? Dick Tripp was quite a guy. He was one of the 10,000 Grand Club. He waved over 10,000 carrier landings in his career and doing that. Okay, how do we do it at night? We needed some way to see the LSO who's giving all these visual signals. The story is there's a bunch of junior officers probably that were in a nightclub someplace. And they're watching the dancing girls and they realized that dancing girls were glowing. There was ultraviolet light and they were wearing fabric costumes that was sensitive to UV lighting, which made them glow. And they applied this idea to the LSOs. The LSO wore a striped suit and their paddles that were sensitive to ultraviolet light. And there was a couple of ultraviolet lamps down with the LSO's feet chaining up into his face. Uh, not very effective, uh, hard for him to see what was going on, on the outside. At the same time, it was only a glow. It could not be seen from very far away. So it was a little bit difficult to pick them up with the system, but it did work for a while. So what they came up with was this. Nighttime exposure, of course, so you can see a lot of blurring with the, with the long exposure and doing the thing like he's giving a fast signal there, by the way. And it kind of jumped around and looked like, what did the LSO suit look like? This is what he looked like. They were detachable. Uh, they were all pinned to his suit. The thing I'll have you notice is look at the tremendous number of connections up around his neck and shoulders and hooking all these crazy lights up. There were more at his wrists to, so he could plug into his uh, paddles. The paddles, of course, didn't have to be solid because all it counted was that little square of light. Many is a story of a dark and rainy night and the salt spray coming over the platform and those connectors shorting out and giving the LSO a couple shocks that made him run around a little bit in the thing. Interesting system. What was the pattern like at night? Look familiar? It's exactly the same as it was in the daytime. So there you are, 150 feet, you start a descending turn to below 100 feet, turning and looking out into the dark, hoping and praying to see a couple of little lights on the flight deck and the lights of your landing signal officer. It was a little bit of a different world. Ha, ah, luxury Great Lakes steamer. Now, why would I bring that up if I'm talking about the history of aircraft carriers? When the war began, where are you gonna train people to land on an aircraft carrier? Both coasts had a problem with submarines. They did try running a carrier up and down the Chesapeake Bay. 
but the expression was sea room. There just wasn't enough room to work. It didn't really work out right. So the Navy bought two of these um, Great Lakes steamers, and they said, let's convert them into quote unquote aircraft carriers. Here's a picture of the other one. That was the Greater Buffalo. This is the C and B. And they modified it again by throwing all that good furniture over the side, chopping it in part, and putting a flight deck onto it. You'll see the flight deck is very low. It's only 28 feet as opposed to the 60 foot normal on the Essex class carriers and did that. They used them for nothing but quals. There was no hangar deck. You couldn't lower airplanes down there. If they had a problem with one blocking the deck, they kind of hung it over the side by cables before they could bring it back. They operated from the Navy Pier in Chicago on Lake Michigan. And many is the story of the morning commuters in Chicago driving along in Navy airplanes were flying around overhead, preparing to land on board um, the Wolverine or the Sable when they're doing their carrier qualifications and have that. Interesting vessels. They were coal powered still. So lots and lots of black smoke came out of the stacks. And interestingly, they were side wheelers. You can barely see where the side wheel, side paddle wheels fit on the side of those. So it didn't leave a wake, which Navy pilots kind of depended on for their lineup. There was no wake involved. They had a Coast Guard icebreaker in the winter time and doing that qualified a lot of people. The numbers are almost bog mind boggling um, when you find out that are talking about 30 or my number here, 32,000, um, I'm sorry, 120,000 landings were, were on these two ships uh, during, the, during the war. Uh, more jargon here, the Navy didn't even consider them carriers officially. They were called miscellaneous ships. Then IX, but they were commissioned, so they were USS when they have the thing. Of interest to those of us in the museum business with old airplanes is this has become the source of many airplanes pulled up from the bottom of Lake Michigan. The water is cold, deep, and fresh, so there's not a real problem with the thing. The uh, there was 128 aircraft loss over the uh, of the Wolverine and the Sable at the time, and they're slowly bringing some of them up for restoration. Now, what do we have here at the Virginia Beach Military Aviation Museum for carrier airplanes? There's our big four, probably, in doing that. I think the Avengers getting ready to get back and retry another thing. You think of any others? How about this one? The SNJ. Our particular model isn't the carrier version, but the SNJ-4C stood for carrier, and they put a tail hook on SNJs. And many a carrier, many a Navy pilot got his first carrier landings in an SNJ, especially equipped for tail hook aviation and doing that. We've got more. How about these two? Stretching a point, but they were both carrier aircraft used at one point. The sea hur the hurricane became the sea hurricane. Nice wide landing gear, put a tail hook on it, and you're ready to go. Amazing story before it became a sea hurricane. During the evacuation of Norway in 1940, the entire squadron of hurricanes with no experience, Royal Air Force pilots, flew out to the carrier Glorious and landed safely on board with no experience. It took some of the wind out of us to brag about how difficult it is to land on their ship, but they all made it. One of these things. The Spitfire was converted in, instead of being, officially it was a sea Spitfire, but of course it became known as a sea fire and doing that. Terrible carrier airplane. It might have been a great fighter, but it was pretty awful at the ship. During the invasion of Sicily, uh, time went on, in the first two days of operations, half of the ceasefires were no longer flyable. By the fourth day, one quarter of them were still flyable. Landing gear just didn't work. However, the idea was per persisted and kept going. And eventually, by the time of Korea, it came up like that. The Sea Fire turned into a very good carrier airplane. But you'll notice the terrifically oversized rudder on the thing, overpowered engine, counter rotating props of the Super Griffin engine, the thing. So that's our connections more with carrier airplanes. Leaving a little bit from the purview of the Military Aviation Museum, first 50 years of, of uh, military aviation. So now we're talking about 1953. 
These are the accident statistics. This is not combat losses. The Korean War was just over about halfway through this year. You can see the disaster that was happening. It was not particularly great. The rate there of 51, uh, accident, over 51 accidents per 100,000 hours was absolutely terrific. Lost a lot of people. Latest figure for the last 10 years is less than one accident per 100,000 hours. What's the difference? Well, we already met one of the differences in the thing, the angle deck. You can see it's terrific. Little colorization to show you what we're talking about for chromatic here. Um, you can see that the barrier is gone. Nowadays, you have a problem. You missed the resting gear for one reason or the other. You have a chance of going around and working out there. It was the English that came up with a very simple idea for a visual guidance landing system. Okay, there we go. They came up with a mirror. It simply had a light that shined into the mirror. You tilt the mirror at the degree if you want the glide slope to be. It was a four degree glide slope. So instead of this long flat pass near a stall, you could fly a descending approach with some power on the thing. What they had was a source light. This is a shore installation, obviously. And you can see the, uh, uh, the, the source lights, we call them all the way through a row of lights. The mirror was parabolic simply to get more intensity in the lights. It took all those lights and made them into one ball uh, shape, one dot, and it became, of course, known as the meatball. Green reference lines on the outside. If the little ball went up, it meant you were high. If it went down, it meant you were low. Uh, then red lights for the wave off signal on the sides and the thing. One of the problems involved with this type of air, with airplanes of various types is different airplanes had different what they called hook to eye clearances. Where's the pilot's eye in reference to where the tail hook is? You get a big long airplane or one that's got a high angle of attack and it's a bigger number than it is for some of the smaller numbers. And the answer was the whole contraption went up and down. You'll see here the English installation with a guy with his very natty beret on, uh, cranking the mirror up or down to correct for individual airplanes. And that's what they did. Mirrors are subject to all kinds of problems. They got dirty. Uh, something got in front of the source lights that would cut it out. Um, you needed the distance, and there's a whole setup in the thing. So they relied on an 18th century French physicist named Fresnel, who built the Fresnel lens, or designed the concept of the Fresnel lens. A Fresnel lens is nothing more than a big fat lens that has been flattened. If you want to see an example, go look at the tail lights of your car, tail lights and backup lights, and they're Fresnel lenses. Other example are these sheets you have for magnifying a page to read a page, that's a Fresnel lens. Terrific advantage for the Fresnel lens, because now there's no external light source. The light is actually in the box. Now they're temperature controlled, the lens is all set. It's actually not a ball anymore, it's a bar of light, but from any sort of distance, you can't tell the difference and they have it from there. Again, the reference uh, lights on the side and you have that. Progress continued and the Fresnel lens gave way to good old LEDs. It looks a little bit strange, but now the intensity is much better, the concentration is much better, you can keep going it. But the same reference lights are there on the outside. So now we have the visual landing aids. Landing signal officers, when the mirror came out, somebody said, we don't need LSOs anymore to give signals. And the answer is yes, it turned out we did very much. And we have the thing though. The main thing is he still has to make that final last minute split second decision as to whether an airplane's in a safe position to land aboard the ship. Secondary function became training. Every landing is graded, they're all recorded, and you have it going from there. Um, here's my beloved vigilante coming aboard in the 60s. Uh, the LSO platform now has grown considerably in size, and there's all sorts of extra equipment helping them and doing that. And of course, cram a lot of people on the platform now. This is my era when we're doing it. I can't believe once upon a time when I had a lot of hair, I wore it real short, and now that I got a little bit of hair, I gotta wear it long. Modern team has come up even differently. Uh, many more people in the platform. The minimum number now I think is three. Before you can do a recovery, you've got the primaries and the secondaries and the guys spotting the deck. And they made them all wear a uniform now, the float coats and have it going from there. Best seat in the house. You can see more things and get more part of the action there than almost anywhere else. Interesting picture, F4 Phantom. 
I'll have you note this airplane up here. Let's go back to the Tonkin Gulf in 1967. Intrepid, one of the 27 Charlies. We did not carry Phantoms on board. They were too big an airplane. Our resting gear and catapults were okay for them, but just a matter of deck multiple. And nor do we carry A6s or E2s either. There are the Phantoms. We're on the platform one fine late afternoon doing a recovery. And the airplanes are basically on board and we looked up on the LSO platform and there's an F4. His landing gear down, his flaps down, and his hook down. We got on the squawk box and called up to the air boss and says, boss, we got a phantom in the groove. And he goes back and he says, he's probably got battle damage. Take him. So sure enough, there he came. The F4 lands, traps aboard the Intrepid. It was kind of interesting. Came down to our ready room. Of course, as he walks in, we're immediately besieging him. With, What's wrong with your airplane? How'd you get hit? What's wrong with your airplane? And the guy kind of looked at us and says, well, the TACAN navigation system doesn't work, but other than that, not much. And he made the story even better. They get out of the airplane and they're walking up this now quiet flight deck. And he's shaking his head, muttering, they're never going to let me hear the end of this. In his back seater, his RIO says to him, why? I thought it was a pretty good landing. And he says, you idiot, we're on the wrong ship. And that's the first time the back seater realized it. There's an old Navy tradition involved here. Aircraft that land by mistake on the wrong ship tend to get decorated. The first shot was taken a few minutes before the bottom shot. Uh, with the modern things, you can really tell it's hard to get a photograph. There's magic marker messages all over this thing, but they're hard to tell in the gray. Of course, the spray painting is there. In the old days, it was a lot easier. Officers and chiefs all had white shoes. And white shoes came with polish with a big foam applicator tip on them. So when an airplane made a mistake in the old days of landing on the wrong ship, it was easy enough to make it very embarrassing. By the way, the pilot that had done it was the one that got to clean the airplane off and doing that. Small pitch for my book. If you want to know more about what we're just talking about, you get the book. It's for sale at the museum shop, available other places if you can't wait until then. Uh, contact me and do it. We got that going from there. Okay, let's open up to any questions we have. All right, Boom, if you'll just give me one second, I'm going to go ahead and post the link to the museum store's listing for your book in the chat so that everyone who wants to uh, can get <laughs> it from there. So um, even though the museum is closed, the store is fulfilling orders and uh, every purchase does go to supporting the museum in this kind of trying time. So we sure appreciate your consideration on the subject. Mm -hmm. Boom, um, we had an early question uh, asked really before you got underway that, that was wanting to know a little bit more about what it's like to actually live on a ship and particularly an aircraft carrier. Can you speak a little bit about, about life at sea on an aircraft carrier? Oh, wow. Um... Let's talk about the good news, first of all. First of all, you're living in an airport and you get a lot of flying. <laughs> the second one that's always kind of funny is you don't have to commute to get to work. Um, you're right there. I always kind of joked about that. I mean, the wardroom where you eat is at most, you know, a couple hundred feet away uh, to your stateroom where you live and you've got that. And then, of course, you do your work in the flight deck. So I think that's kind of a big part of it. Um, a lot of fresh air when you want to hack, take a break and go off to the side. So that's kind of part of it. Of course, the separation is always the kind of the bad news for most people. Uh, pulling away for a long time. Uh, you know, I've made a nine-monther, uh, and that's pretty much of a strain. Uh, modern communications has helped that problem a little bit, but it's still kind of tough. The other thing I always kind of enjoy pointing out for aircraft carriers, everybody has these visions of, uh, of this wonderful time at sea, uh, thinking about cruise liners. Uh, look at an aircraft carrier and tell me how many windows there are, portholes. And the answer is almost none. It is rare when you can see outside anywhere. It's all internal spaces. It's all in artificial lighting. And you're constantly uh, living in an interior thing. Um, and then the other part of being at sea, of course, is aircraft carriers are funny. Um, there'll be times when, when you're just sailing along like it's a lake and you look outside and your destroyer escorts are, are bobbing around like corks. And there's other times when the wave uh, frequency is such that the destroyers are just kind of slowly going up and down on them. In the meantime, the carrier is pitching. 
um, they do move. Uh, the picture you're looking at now is actually what they call seat trials, uh, something that every air aircraft carrier skippers I love. It's now, here's the keys to the hot rod, go and have fun uh, doing maximum turns. We always try to schedule that evolution uh, between meal times, and something always happens where it slides into lunchtime and you're sitting there eating and suddenly you have to grab your fork and plate and iced tea. Thanks, Boom. Uh, we've got a couple questions here about how you earned your nickname. Can you tell us a little bit about how Robert Powell became the Oh, Boom? let's see. We're in such a thing and everybody's here for it. Um, my usual answer, not to put everybody off, is I never do it without a drink in my hand. Uh, <laughs> and kind of, but I got a good audience, so I'll go, the, the quick version of it is uh, the airplane I flew, the Vigilante, uh, very high speed. Um, very high speed and good looking airplane, sexy, wonderful airplane. Um, I had lost my hydraulic systems over Laos one night and diverted into the Air Force Base at Yuban, Thailand. Uh, we were celebrities. They had very few Navy airplanes in there and never seen a vigilante before. Uh, it took about three days to get the airplane fixed. Um, anyway, so they would watch the whole thing. And of course, uh, they had a big turnout for when I departed and doing the normal thing. Of course, it was a maintenance repair. So we took the airplane up high and uh, ran a couple of checks and said, okay, the airplane's fine. And to this day, I don't know if there's me or my backseater um, said, uh, called Yuban Tower and says, hey, Yuban, how about a flyby? And they called us and said, sure, how low do you want to go? And anyway, I lit the afterburners and made a pass up the runway at Yuban, Thailand. Um, guys on the ground, our maintenance guy said, oh, it looked terrific. All you can see is this gray cloud coming off the tail. Anyway, pulled up, rolled it a couple times, uh, headed out to the ship, landed aboard Kitty Hawk. And nothing happened for about a week. And then my commanding officer pulled me into a stateroom at one point and demanded, what the bleep did I do in Yuban last week? And I went, sir. And they had air messages there from Sync Pack all the way up a four-star admiral. And when that happens, the military guys understand what happens when it rolls downhill. It gains an intensity, volume, and smell. And there I am as a mere lieutenant. Uh, my career was over. I think keel hauling was actually mentioned at one point. And who knows, it was apparently the ties um, kind of rioted and went to the base demanding payment for all the broken windows they had on the sections off the base. So my life was miserable for about another week. And then finally I saw a message that uh, I wasn't really supposed to have seen. It was from the Air Force high level and business, business, business. By the last paragraph said, good looking airplane in Yuban a couple of weeks ago. When's it going to come again? And at that point, I wiped the sweat off my bow. My male name is Robert, which becomes Bob. And in the Navy, it became Boog after the Baltimore Royals first baseman. And the shift from Boog to Boom didn't take any work at all. Anyway, that's how I got my name. Well, I think we all appreciate you sharing that story with us. Um, <laughs> Boom, we've had a bunch of questions about the angled deck and what sort of drove its the, the evolution of the carrier to utilizing that angled deck. Can you talk a little bit about the safety improvements that came along with the deck? Oh, um, I'm sorry. To me, it, it, it just seems so obvious. You know, instead of having this barricade in front of you where you had no place else to go, you suddenly had it. Um, the barriers in front of you. They still kept the barricade. There are still barricades on ships to this day and with the angled deck. Um, and that's strictly in case of emergency, broken tail hook, something else going wrong, the airplane can't trap, or he's so low on fuel, you absolutely have to get him to rig the big, the big net, the big barricade. Um, the angle just kind of, kind of, you know, just they say it's there, it's some place to go, uh, an alternative in front of you. Even for the wave offs, I um, mean, a late wave off on a straight deck, it was still possible to drag up through the pack, uh, where in this case you're already angled off to the side. Good deal. Should have been thought of years before. 
Okay, and uh, another set of follow-on questions uh, about the design of the flight deck and everything. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why islands are positioned where they're positioned? And uh, we've actually got a question here about the current generation British carriers having two islands and a question about why that might be the case. Um, yeah, there was a, the big argument all the way through is how many degrees do you want to set the thing off? The Brits tended towards a narrower angle for some reason. They're only talking, I'm trying to remember, I think the Arch Royals was about five degrees, six degrees, where ours are typically 11 to 12. Uh, it doesn't sound like much until you look at the design of the ship and you do have that. So you pick it whichever way you want. There was a lot of, of uh, discussion early on on how to do it. Um, you go through some of the earlier carrier craft carriers, you see all kinds of things. I mean, tapered bows, slanting bows, so you had a little downhill roll, slanting up landing areas. A couple of them now are ramps, uh, the very aft end of the flight deck, as you can see in this picture, angled down a little bit. But there were some of them that, I mean, just dropped way back to try to minimize air, uh, turbulence. Uh, from the thing going on, hence we call them the ramp. Uh, another small interesting one uh, is the Japanese uh, built uh, two of their aircraft carriers, two of their major aircraft carriers in World War II, had their islands on the port side of the ship. They tried it that way. And the idea was you could stay, you could steam these two ships side by side, recover airplanes from both, and the traffic patterns were off to the other side for each one of them. They tried it, the Kaga and the Kaga and the Soryu, Soryu and Hiryu and the Kaga and the Akagi. And which one of those was the left port angle, I don't remember. So it just kind of developed all the way through. Thank you. I think that answers uh, pretty much everyone's questions relative to the positioning of the island. Um, Boom, can you talk to us about bailing off the LSO platform. Has, have you ever had to do it? And is it a, is it a routine occurrence? <laughs> oh, I'm laughing because some of the stories about bailing off the LSO platform, um, the safety net developed. You saw it in kind of a couple of the pictures there to have them. Uh, the problem is once you're in the net, you've got to go someplace else. So there you scrabble to get through some hatchway back into the interior of the ship. Um, a couple of rules, though, um, on the thing is you never wanted to be the first one into the net because all your buddies are going to land on top of you. And there are actual cases of guys having an arm or a leg broken by somebody jumping on top of them, just trying to get away from an errant aircraft trying to get after you. Um, and the other, the other one that's always a favorite among the LSOs when you're actually on the ship and you can see how far out this net sticks. Um, they're running carrier quals and a couple pilots came out, not LSOs, pilots came out to watch, a little bit on the nervous side. And one thing you brief for visitors out the LSO platform is it says, listen, if I ever slam my elbow into your ribs, jump into the net and keep going. And sure enough, some airplane came and wobbled and looked dangerous like that. And the LSO nudges this other pilot in the ribs and he very enthusiastically managed to jump completely over the net. <laughs> and fell all the way into the ocean. <laughs> they had to pull them out again. So it's it's always kind of a problem on the thing, but we're glad they're there. And notice they're padded now too. They're not just straight straight mesh. All right. Um, we've got a question here talking about the 27 Charlies. Um, you mentioned a bunch of aircraft, air, different aircraft types that were not routinely assigned to 27 Charlies. Can you talk about what the regular complement on such a ship would have been? Uh, typically, um, well, the old Skyhawk is always kind of one of those things. Okay, typically a 27 Charlie um, would have had Crusaders on board, F-8 Crusaders on board for the fighter squadrons, probably two. You would probably have two squadrons of A-4 Skyhawks on board. Um, Pre-1967, it would have had a squadron of Sky Raiders on board, the old prop jobs that were still there. Their early warning airplanes would have been the E-1. It would have been a detachment of three or four E-1s, again, propeller-driven airplanes, and a little bit smaller. Um, you know, and then probably some more Sky Raiders for electronic warfare, carrying all kinds of interesting stuff. 
Uh, now, uh, again, beginning, let's see, 65, the independents went over there, and that was one of the first. Um, that was the first deployment for the A6 intruder and the first deployment, the combat deployment for the vigilante. Uh, they were on board, very large reconnaissance airplanes. Um, they still had A4s then, but eventually their attack squadrons became A7 squadrons. And of course, the A6 with its bomb carrying thing replaced the Sky Raider squadrons. And then A2s were their early warning aircraft and probably carried an A3 or two. Um, which is very nice because they were used as tankers and had electronic warfare capabilities. And that was kind of the lineup for Vietnam days, big deck versus small deck. Okay. Boom, can you talk to us a little bit about what makes an aircraft easier or harder to land on a carrier? Um, let's not say harder. Yeah, let's say it's harder. A little bit more challenging. Um, none of the, the, the limits you had were part of the thing. The, the first thing you have to accept, of course, is the aircraft are designed for, um, which is helpful, number one. You know the gear is steady, and you don't flare the airplane when you land on an aircraft car. You just absolutely hold the attitude you have. So your rate of descent is down there, and it's truly a slam into the deck. What you have to do, the LSO grading system, um, they called OK is a good pass. Uh, and then there was fair, and then there was no grades and low grades and a couple other things. But to get an okay pass, you had to be within five feet of the center line of the deck and then hit either the two or the three wire. And the distance you had there was 100, and I'm making up numbers a little bit here, about 120 feet fore and aft. So picture drawing this little spot on a flight deck. Um, and that's where you had to touch down to get a good grade on an aircraft carrier landing. Other problems we had, the turbulence we already, already mentioned, uh, there was still some, each ship kind of had its own, uh, feeding off the island structure, number one. Um, plus, of course, the motion of the ship became part of it. And then every so often, the ship's engineers would screw up on the old ones, uh, and it's mix up their, layer, layer, uh, their, their fuel ratios, and they'd be dumping black smoke uh, the thing, and you could actually lose sight of the ship in the in the black smoke behind the groove. So it was always interesting. It was good fun. We've got a kind of an interesting question here uh, about World War II era aircraft carrier operations. Boom, can you talk a little bit about how pilots found their ships in World War II? Oh, I'm sure how they did what on their ships? How they found their way back to their ships after <laughs> performing a mission. Yeah, okay, that's another question that has me laughing on the thing. If you if you will look at the um, oh pictures of them manning up in various places, I got a couple in the book, and even some of the airplanes. Uh, even by the time I flew uh, Sky Raiders, well after their combat career, and in my old F9 Cougar, which I flew in the uh, training command. The instrument panel had a long slot across it, all the way across. And what you had was a removable platform, a board, which stuck in there. And the board had an E6B B computer built into it and this massive round grid thing. And this was your, your plotting board. And after takeoff, you noted your heading and how long you flew that heading. And you made these marks on that thing and you twisted it. And the ship gave you a, they called it a PIM, position, position of intended movement. In other words, if you were out on a four hour mission, the ship said four hours from now, here's where we're gonna be. And you use this plotting board to work that out. Not the best thing in the world. All Navy pilots in those days were trained to do what they called a square search. Um, I can still tell you the pattern if you really needed to know it. And the idea was you got back to this PIM and then started a square search until you found the ship. Finally, a little bit later in the war, they, they came up with a, uh, what was the name of it? The YZ system. And the ship had a broadcast that sent out and the sectors had different letters in all the sectors, okay? And you had this for your day. The, today's today's uh, sectors were such and such. And you'd fly along until you could pick up the signal and identify the Morse code. 
and you look at your magic plot for the day and you say, oh, I'm up here in 240 degree radial away from the ship. You say, okay, I know one fact now. I've either got to fly 240 or you know, 180 to get back to the ship. I got the wrong numbers there. To fly back from the ship. And you turn to one of those headings, knowing it was good for you, and you'd fly. And if all of a sudden you got another Morse code, you'd say, oh, wait a minute, it's gotten narrower and I'm in this cone. And that affects where you were, were even more. Um, navigation was a real problem. It was very difficult. Uh, the YC system wasn't the best and relied on radio frequencies that uh, did not transmit pretty well. So it was, uh, it was a bit difficult, a bit difficult to go through in the day. A couple more questions here about uh, your personal experiences on board these ships. Um, can you tell us how many traps you have? Um, 438. I do think I'd have that number memorized, but I don't. Uh, 438, uh, just about 100 of those were at night, uh, which is way less than a lot of other guys are getting. There's, there's many people now that have that thousand for their careers. But like I say, my career was kind of odd. Um, and did that. So, but just absolutely loved it. I'd go back and, and do that again in a trice. Let me say something about this picture I just threw up. So we weren't staring at the same one for the question and answer period. Um, this one kind of sums up how efficient the U.S. Navy got um, during the war years. The first Hellcat right in front of us right here is being parked. He was all the way up farther forward. You'll see the guy on the side there with his chocks. The next airplane has just cleared the barriers which have been lowered, he come over them, the barrier has been raised, and the third airplane is minutes away from, seconds away from touchdown. And that's the type of pace the flight deck worked at during the war, it was a terrific operation. Next question. This may help, uh, this, this particular graphic actually helps answer one of the questions, Boom. Um, they taxied under power around on the deck, and we've talked a lot about landing, and we've talked a little bit about takeoff. Can you talk to us a little bit about what happens in between while the flight deck is reset to resume operations uh, during World War II? Um, well, if you were a pilot, it was it was great. You were down either eating a meal or drinking coffee or goofing off and taking a nap in the ready room. Uh, if you were a flight deck crew or one of the mechanics, you were busy as can be. You were working your little butt off. Uh, because what would happen for a, <clears throat> excuse me, for a strike is all the airplanes would be parked forward, as I mentioned, type of the thing. The barriers would all be put down, and they have to push all these airplanes back. They didn't use many motor, motor tugs. Most of the time, it was strict human labor that just pushed them back. In the meantime, the airplanes have to be refueled. They have to be rearmed. Any mechanical problems would have to be done and repaired. Uh, so they're getting ready for the second cycle to go. Uh, for the pilots uh, and the crew members, oh, I'm guessing from those days, it took us in Vietnam days, about a half an hour before the launch time, you would go down, you get a brief on the thing, the intel guys would talk, the meteorologists would talk, your flight leaders would get you together and you'd discuss the particular flight, you'd talk about your targets, and you'd go man up and do that. And that became kind of the same thing. So everybody manned the airplanes at once for that launch. To get strapped in, your individual plane captains will be the ones to start the airplanes when they're ready to go. Um, once everybody's up and running, your engines have time to warm up, and then they start taxing airplanes forward for the takeoff. Boom, obviously catapults have become kind of synonymous with carrier operations nowadays. <laughs> yep. um, they weren't necessarily always a fixture of World War II launches. Can you talk a little bit about how aircraft were launched in World War II? Normal and all the way up until then, um, again, this is a case of the aircraft driving demands on the other end. Normal was a deck run. Um, of course, the example that everybody kind of likes to talk about was the B-25s that Doolittle flew off and how much computing they had to do and how little it kind of was and how much wind there was over the deck. Uh, for most operations, um, there was plenty of room to deck run. And what they do is when they park the airplanes aft, they'd arrange them in such a way, we're again talking World War II, they'd put the fighters up front because they were called the lightest and they had the shortest takeoff runs and they can do that. And then they'd put the dive bombers, the uh, hell divers, uh, and then later on, of course, the torpedo bombers, the Avenger at the back end of the pack. So they'd have that extra couple hundred of feet 
which has now been vacated by the fighters as they went off. But then as time went on, airplanes were getting heavier and heavier, high temperatures and doing that. And they said, OK, let's start using catapults um, and fire them off from there. They used a, a simple uh, strap, a hook on the bottom of the airplanes. Navy airplanes have hooks on the bottom for catapulting. Uh, which hooked around a loop and a loop hooked around the shuttle on the top of the catapult for the catapult shot. Great guy. Since you had the experience of catapult shots, can you describe for, for us lay folk what that's like? <laughs> um, again, I'm laughing um, because it's a wow moment. It just everything just sort of happens. Um, it also sounds a little bit funny to say, but pilots, I think, actually prefer landing on board the carrier than the cat shot, because we're in control for the landing. The cat shot is good luck. You know, everybody else has to have something going exactly the way it belongs. Uh, things you do, you do need to know, though, is the major uh, difference that happened in catapulting, and I'm talking to the 60s now, and again, the English, besides the angle deck and the mirror, they came up with steam catapults. Hydraulic ones were the ones first, actually the very first ones way back when were gunpowder, um, which is a terrific bang, but that was only used for light airplanes and, cat and, and shipboard stuff. Um, and a hydraulic catapult was all the energy has hit you at once. Somebody once described it as like being hit in the back of the head with a two by four when that catapult starts. Steam kind of builds the strength all the way through and it's a much smoother shot. But even then, it's it's uh, um, it's pretty intense. Uh, you're pretty well back there and doing your thing. Uh, our rule, I think a lot of the other airplanes use the same thing. Our rule was, of course, when you're getting ready, you look at them, the signal you use when you're finally ready to go is uh, you salute the catapult officer and he returns your salute. And then he makes some more signals. He's not the guy that actually fires the catapult, by the way. His signal is he touches the deck. And the sailor on the edge of the deck is the one that actually pushes a button and has it ready to go from there. But anyway, salute the catapult officer. You've even got a couple of seconds, a couple, take a deep breath, um, position your hand on the stick exactly where you want it for the shot. And then you put your head all the way back in the headrest of your ejection seat and hold it there tight. You actually, you actually push back. When you feel the catapult fire, you start trying to pull your head forward. If you can, you eject. In other words, the acceleration has gone wrong and something isn't working right. And as a result, when you actually clear the deck and the catapult releases, your head kind of snaps forward a little bit. And you got it from there. Okay? Sounds interesting. Um... Can, can you talk a little bit about the special pattern that was adopted to allow the Corsair to land on board the ship? Uh, we've got a couple folks who've asked questions about what was distinctly different about getting that aircraft back aboard a carrier versus any number of other large cowled, big radial engined uh, World War II well, Navy aircraft. I'm gonna stick my nose out and my neck out here a little bit, uh, not being a carrier Corsair guy, I'm gonna say there's not much difference. Um, it has the reputation because I think the nose looks longer, but if you look at the, those Hellcats there, you have the same problem. If you remember when I talked about the carrier landing pattern, all the airplanes in those days would make this curving approach. They'd keep this turn going to have a better view of the LSOs are coming in. You'd be watching the LSO and doing that, and then all of a sudden he'd go, okay, level your wings. Okay, you're in good shape. And that was almost immediately followed by a cut. And once you get the cut, you just chop the power. And the airplane naturally, aerodynamically, the nose starts to come down. And so you look at the deck a little bit and you kind of time yourself to so you get a three-point attitude established to, to land into the deck. So I think the course of the early Corsairs had problems, but we're talking mechanics and design here. We're talking landing gear, oleo struts and cockpit position and you know other things like that. So the Corsair was a Corsair. You think about the fact that um, by the 19, late 40s and into the 50s, uh, Advanced Training Command, if you were heading for fighter type aircraft, in the Advanced Training Command, you'd be flying a Hellcat or a Corsair or a Bearcat for advanced training. 
So, the, you know, like everything else, the airplanes when they started out had a little more of a fearsome reputation and people figured out, yeah, hey, there's a way to do it. Okay, you mentioned cuts just now. Um, Boom, you were obviously an LSO at a period when there was still radial engine aircraft landing on aircraft carriers as well as jet-powered aircraft. Is there a difference as to how you handle that sort of cut procedure in those two different types of airplanes? Um, a little bit. The thing that changed for the propeller guys is all of a sudden they're flying the same pattern as the jets. In other words, they all lifted this about 600 foot, 700 foot downwind. They'd start their turn. It was a constantly descending turn, not the old flat pass. And they flew the mirror. They flew the meatball um, and brought that in. And then on speed, what happened though is on the they left on the on the mirror system. The other set of green lights, there's the green reference lights out to the side, and on top of the mirror was some more green lights. And they were called cut lights for the very reason that we still cut the prop airplanes. The E-1s and the Sky Raiders um, still got cut even in modern times um, in doing that. So that was kind of the only real difference in the thing. It made a big difference. Uh, I was fortunate enough to carrier qualify in a Sky Raider, like I say, long after its, its combat time was gone. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm the last person in the United States Navy to carrier qualify in a Sky Raider. And for me as a historian, it was a revelation compared to what I'd been taught. Uh, all of a sudden I understood now why the old guys had trouble in jets because our big accusation was don't spot the deck, don't look at the deck. They're watching the meatball, watch the meatball. When you take a cut and a prop, you watch the deck. All of a sudden you look at it to get yourself set in that final attitude to touch down and you do that. The LSOs, the, in one hand, you had a radio headset and the other side was the pickle and the pickle had two buttons on it. One of them was the wave off lights to get rid of an airplane. The other was the cut lights. And that was for cutting the props in the old days. In modern times, it's evolved now. And if you mess many LSOs, why are these still called cut lights? They, they you get a blank look because in the old days we cut props with them. Now they use them for various signals if you're not working with the radio. It replaces the Roger Ball call. Um, and then you can use it for a little bit of power. I want a little bit of power without while talking on the radio. You blip it with the green cut lights. and It means I want a little bit of power from it and do that. So yeah, that's the way you work the props in the, into modern times. All right, we've got just a few more questions that we have time to take. Uh, there are many, dozens more questions we unfortunately won't get to this evening. Um, Boom, can you talk a little bit about the deck materials used on different iterations of the aircraft carrier? I think <laughs> this picture you have up here now is a, is a good one that describes kind of World War II U.S. Navy deck material. Uh, yeah, but different um, countries had different preferences. Yes, yes, and different paint schemes. Um, you know, how do you paint your carrier deck? Um, the biggest one though, which is, which is historically significant. Um, there's a terrific book out on Midway called The Shattered Sword, which I can't recommend enough for anybody that's really interested in this carrier business. And it's different because it discusses Midway, not even strategic, not even tactical. It talks procedures. There's a couple chapters in there on damage control, which are revealing. What happened is the British and the Japanese carriers kind of evolved the same way. The first Japanese carrier aircraft, by the way, were Sopwiths, flown by a Royal Navy, RAF pilot, who went over to do their thing. Anyway, what they did is their flight decks were their main deck. They were armored. They were made out of heavy steel. And their hangar bays were basically enclosed spaces. They had them. They obviously had hatches and doorways on the side of the thing, but nothing like ours with a whole big side of the hangar bay basically opens. And our flight decks were fairly light and then covered with wood originally in World War II. Um, the difference being, of course, that it already sucked a bomb down. That was nice. It went through the flight deck and maybe it exploded in a hangar bay. Not a good thing, but the explosion was not contained is all this open space in the side of the hangar doors. A British carrier, or in particular the Japanese carriers, they took an armor-piercing bomb that goes to the flight deck 
explodes in the hangar bay and you've got a disaster going because it's a closed space it's in. So it makes a big difference. As the jets came in, I don't even sure when they started putting steel in the landing area. The landing areas kind of became steel uh, for the big thing. Uh, this is the 27 Charlies I'm talking about. But once they started building the big deck and the forest all on, the, the complete deck was steel all the way up and on from there. Or are we talking about textured surfaces? <laughs> well, maybe, Boom, you can speak a little bit to the, the different sort of traction characteristics of the surfaces that were used. I'm sorry, the what now? Give me that again. Are there, uh, are there different characteristics in terms of slipperiness or, or traction wise attached to the different surfaces oh well, there's no question about it um the wood was stayed pretty well wood and i'm not sure when the navy started putting this, uh, uh, anti skid surfaces on there you know fresh anti skid surface is abrasive i mean there's no other way to describe it it's ridged it's rough i mean you can almost feel it when you're taxing on it the ridges are that high the problem with it, even the latest sophisticated materials, the thing wear out and they start getting worn um, and more goes on. And then the, during the length of the deployment, you're not gonna be able to replace your anti-skid. So not only is it worn, but it's got hydraulic fluid on it and fuel spills and oil spills and just kind of general dirt um, going through the thing. So you always were very leery on, you know, as time went on the thing. The deck markings would start to disappear, um, the center lines and the, and the edges of the, of the landing area. So it tended to get a little bit slippery. And again, one of the things you kind of adjusted to, and then you had a rainy day or a little salt spray and, and carrier days sometimes get very interesting. Thanks, Boom. And our last question for this evening, uh, we're going to kind of relate back to the pusher. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of went through your head as a naval aviator, part of this great storied tradition, uh, getting the opportunity to fly a Curtis pusher? Um, yeah, I just, and I can't say enough about it. It's just uh, so so impressive uh as I, as I said in the book i said my my uh consideration of ely just shot off the charts i mean how these guys could land these early airplanes lightly wing loaded miserable control responses um it was phenomenal and i'm just so so glad i could do it worked out pretty well all right. With that said, boom, that brings us to the end of this evening. Thank you so much for your time this evening and uh, for okay. for all of the history you've supplied us. Let me add one last quickie shot here. Of course, sure. everybody talks now about joint service and how the services are all getting together and getting organized. I have a picture of when the Air Force takes over the aircraft carriers. <laughs> Thanks for your attention, everybody. <laughs> I think that will be uh, much appreciated by many folks on this uh, webinar this evening. Boom, thank you again for everything this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, that concludes tonight's webinars. Thank you so very much for joining us and thanks again to Boom. <laughs>